everyone. Um, so let's get started quick. Uh, we're going to resume from the prior handouts, in fact. I had mentioned last time uh, we didn't finish it. There was at least a, a page and a bit left. So that's handout 9A. And the part that we're looking at uh, looks like uh, looks like that. So just while you're getting your papers out, uh, just a, a comment on the project feedback. I'm a little bit behind in getting back to some of you as, you, as you've obviously seen from my lack of response. Last week I got uh, tied up in three days of solid departmental stuff that I could not escape. So that block it basically eliminated three days from my regular cycle of replying to email. So what I thought to do to delay things, prevent delaying things further, I will actually be in the tutorial today giving feedback verbally to the groups that are in their tutorial this afternoon. And then anyone who's not there um, in person at the tutorial will uh, get an email later tonight or tomorrow from me. Um, if it's not even your tutorial slot today, between 3.30 and 5.30, feel free to come however anyway, and then um, we can talk about your project then. So that gives a chance for those of you that are waiting on me to respond uh, to get started. Yeah. The TAs, uh, I have the midterms here today. The TAs just coded them into the spreadsheet this morning, so I'll upload that this afternoon. But I will hand the paper copies back to you today uh, at the end of the class. Okay. So um, we're on this uh, handout 9A, and uh, last class we were looking at nonlinear optimization. There is a new concept that will come through, which is independent actually of this topic, but it its most applicability is in this area of non-linear non optimization. So let's understand what this uh, topic is. It's called convexity. And it talks, conve convexity is really talking about the shape of the function. The function on the left is convex. The function on the right is non-convex. So that's a, a start. Visually, you can observe convexity. The algebraic test, however, is given by this fairly messy looking equation up there which essentially says that the red line lies on top of the blue line. Okay, So let's take a look at that. The red line lies above the blue line. Well, this equation up here, this, it's an inequality. So the left and the right hand side, let's look at the, the two parts. Let's perhaps start by looking at, um, I would say, the blue line. Okay, So the blue line the equation is this one here on the left hand side. It says f of gamma x1 plus 1 minus gamma x2. Now gamma is a number that ranges between 0 and 1. It's written for you over there. Let's take a look at the two extremes. Once we understand the two extremes, everything else falls in between. So gamma equals 0. Sub in gamma equals 0 there on the left hand side. And what does that simplify to? f of x2. So if you're on the blue function, the blue function is f of x, f of x2, it's simply telling you that's the point over there, f of x2. Sub in gamma equals 1, as you, gamma equals 1, and it simplifies to f of x1. So you're at this point. Okay, so what this says is then, if you vary gamma between 0 and 1, you're going to move from over here when gamma is 0 along the blue function and land up at that point. So the function on the left hand side is anywhere along the blue point. So in general, gamma x1 plus 1 minus gamma x2 is a point midway between x2 and x1, somewhere. It doesn't have to be exactly midway. Obviously, if gamma is equal to 0.5, it's midway. But we put it midway, we're essentially anywhere along this blue curve. So that formula says that this blue curve lies on the left. Well, what lies on the right? Let's try that again in the same way. Put in gamma equals 0 on the right hand side. And what does it simplify to? Gamma equals 0 on the right hand side. f of x2. So you're over there. Gamma equals 1 on the puts you over there. But if you're going and varying gamma between 0 and 1, you're essentially doing there what you should recognize quite quickly as linear interpolation. You're interpolating anywhere between that point and that point on a straight line. So it simply puts you 
anywhere connected between f of x2 and f of x1 with a straight line. So it says that this red curve, if you can draw this red curve, and at every single value of gamma that you can think of, that red curve lies exactly at the function or above it, the function is convex. So that's a geometric picture and an algebraic picture. We always like to do look at things both ways. Now, the function on the right-hand side, this W shape, is non-convex because there is some region here, some range of the gamma values where the blue look curve lies above the red curve. Okay, so that violates that inequality. Immediately we can say the function there is non-convex. But let's take a look carefully. There was another part of the definition we omitted. It says x1 and x2 that lies inside the fe feasible region S. Okay? So if this is my feasible region S, then that's correct. That function is non-convex. But let me reduce S in scope to be just this range. Now is that function concave or convex or neither? Convex. Now it's convex. Just in that region, it's convex. Just in that region, it's convex. Okay? So the definition for convexity relies on this value gamma that goes between 0 and 1. And it also relies on what your feasible region is. So functions can be non-convex over a large region. But if you reduce the scope down to a smaller uh, subset, you can get convexity in that subset. OK, so then let me perhaps ask you this. Is, well, OK, we'll, we'll come to it in a minute. Um, convexity here is visually observed as well as algebraically. Let's just state one other uh, point to make. And the reason for convexity is because of this important concept down here. If this function f of x that we're trying to minimize is convex, then we know that the minimum we find is a global minimum over that region of feasible space. Okay? This is a, a, such a critical result that we have to really understand it carefully. Why the interest in global minima versus local minimum? So this function here, this W shape, has two minima, one over here and one over there. So if we find one of them, we're not sure that no other minimums exists, right? If we were doing Newton's method and we were coming down this end and we landed up at this minimum, we can report that as the minimum, but we know nothing about what this minimum is, right? This part could have actually come a little bit lower, but we would have solved this function f of x, reported that as the minimum, and said we're optimum. But that's not true for non-convex functions. If this function were convex, then if we find one minimum, we found the global minimum. And we don't have to even consider any other options in that region. Yeah. So if my feasible space is just this region, and I find that minimum, I'm guaranteed it to be a global minimum. Should I? What if the uh, S region was like, larger and the line was above the, the local maximum? OK. So the. So let's take a look at this definition. It says that you can connect any two values of x with a line. So here's one particular set of x's that violate that constraint. So it's non-convex. It's not just, yeah, you can't just connect one set of x's and check them. You have to connect all possible x's between all values of gamma. So look back at that function, uh, de the convexity definition. A function is convex if that result holds at every value of x1 and x2, not just one particular instance of x1 and x2. Okay. So we will actually not check for convexity using this because we can't go possibly connect every single x1 and x2. Okay, so I'm going to show you a way that we can reduce this convexity check to, down to something a little bit simpler. But this is the formal definition for convexity. And it's important because if we find a minimum of a convex function, it is a global minimum. Now, here's another important nuance here. It says, if the function is strictly convex, well, what's the difference between convex and strictly convex? It simply says, a strictly convex function, you replace the less than or equals with just less than. So as written there, this is convex. Strictly convex is just a pure inequality. 
if you can write it with that being true, then if the function is a minimum, that minimum is unique. Okay? Unique minimums are important because what if we had a function that looked like this? It came down and was pretty much a, f a flat line here at the bottom and then went up again. A any point along there is now an optimum. So you don't have a unique minimum. There's multiple minimum available here. So that function is convex, but it's not strictly convex. A strictly convex function would have just a single unique minimum. And when you find the unique minimum, it's also a global minimum. Okay? So the most important one I want you to remember, though, is the idea that if you find a minimum, it's a global minimum. A more restrictive requirement is that that minimum is unique. So let's uh, take that theory on just a little bit further. Sorry, Dylan? To go back to the, uh, the two graphs there, yeah. um, what if the function isn't like a, like a parabola, but more like a, it's like a, an x to the cube function? OK, we'll look at, uh, let's hold that thought, a cubic function. We're going to look at some examples next, and then just remind me then, and we'll look at the cubic. Yeah, OK. Now, Convexity is important. The opposite of convexity is concavity. So if a function positive f of x is convex, if you flip the sign around, it's now concave. So take that parabola and draw it upside down. That's a concave function. With the horns up is convex, horns down is concave. And then the opposite applies. If you have a local maximum, it is a global maximum if the function f of x is you've got two choices concave okay recall our earlier theory that if you want to when we were look remember back in lps when we were writing them in standard form we said that if you minimize f of x that's the same as maximizing the negative f of x. So here, that same thing applies. If you minimizing a convex f of x, it's the same as maximizing a con. So, so if you minimize a convex f of x or maximize a concave negative f of x, then you get global minimum and a global maximum. So it's the same. Same idea that you can just flip the signs and then convex becomes concave. So let's get a bit of practice with this. Um, two algebra, uh, sorry, two geometric examples, A and B. The first one over there, the 3D surface, concave, convex, or neither. There's a line helping you to guide your answer there, drawn for you. So is that 3D surface concave or convex or neither? Devin? Neither. Any votes for convex? No votes for convexity? Concavity? Neither? No one's committing themselves? Neither, OK. Both? Well, like, there's a section of each one. OK, there's a section of each one. So it's convex in some regions and seems to be concave in other regions. So in this region, it's a bowl shape. So it looks like it's convex. Over here, it's, it's like an upside down bowl. It looks concave. But w if we're looking at this entire function as drawn, it's neither. Neither concave nor convex over that 3D area. In particular, this line that's drawn here for you crosses above the surface at one point and crosses below the surface at other points. So we can see that visually even, that it's not convex. What's the other line that's drawn? Uh, that's just uh, mapping that line down on the bottom flat surface. So you can see x1 connected to x2. Yeah. And that's f of x1 and f of x2 on, so on the surface. The second example, concave, convex, or neither. This is the absolute value function. Cross 
Convex. Convex, OK. Every point in that region can be connected with a straight line. And wherever you pick the start and end of that straight line to be will always lie above that function. The next one. So it's uh, convex. It's convex, yeah. The next one, part C, a linear function. For example, f of x, I'm just using as an example, f of x equals to 4x plus 2. Is that function concave, convex, or neither? So in this case, OK, any votes for convexity? What might you think will happen if you sub the function f of x? In this case, I've used 4x plus 2. But what if you put that into that inequality over there? Any like, gut feel of what would happen if you simplified things? OK. Superimpose the lines, Chris? Uh, same, same. same thing. OK, so there is, uh, in black, I've drawn the function. If you connect any two points, any x1 and x2 values, so arbitrarily I'll pick that, those two points, that red curve lies exactly on top of the black line. OK, so here my function f of x in this instance, instead of being nonlinear, my function f of x here is linear. OK, so it's this line. The red curve lies exactly on top of the, the blue curve at any value of x1 and x2. So convex, no. OK, if you, and I leave this to you as a challenge, go sub in that linear function on the left-hand side and the right-hand side and simplify it, you will get that the left side is equal to the right-hand side. So it actually meets that requirement. And then it's also a concave. OK, and then as Mark says, it's also concave. So a linear function has a very special property. So if f of x is linear, it is convex and concave. OK, it's both. Convex and concave. And it, the reason for why we say it's both will become apparent in a few minutes. So linear functions have a very special property of being both simultaneously convex and concave. And prove it to yourself, please, by subbing into that formula and simplifying for any particular linear function ax plus b. Do you always approximate it, or you're always doing two points but linearly? Yeah, two points plus linearly. OK, now this next one, part D, might, uh, takes, uh, takes you a little bit further. If you take two convex functions and sum them up, what is the new function that you get? So if I take a function convex and another function that's also convex, add them together, Is the resulting sum of those two convex functions also convex? Concave? Can't say. Maybe uh, just try it out with a simple example. Here's a convex function. And you add another convex function to it. So the sum of the black curve plus the blue curve. Gut feel. <coughs> convex, OK? So this is a result that you can prove in general that if you take alpha 1 times f1x plus alpha 2 times f2x, and you can keep adding functions, the resulting weighted sum where your weights are alpha 1, alpha 2, if function f1 is convex, function f2 is convex, function f3 is convex, and you sum them up, that result will be a convex function as well, OK? So the general equation for a parabola, as long as you take a parabola with the horns pointing up plus another parabola with the horns pointing up, that resulting function will also be convex. Okay, we're going to rely on this in a minute to visually look at a function. We can then tell if the individual functions are convex 
then the global, the, the overall function is convex. We're go so we're going to use this very, very soon. Yeah. Will it be the strict convex? The requirements then will uh, that strict convexity will have to apply for f1 and f2 and so on as well. Okay. So then in this fill in the blanks, the linear functions are both concave and convex, and weighted sums of convex functions are also convex. Would be your answer there. Okay, so just before we come and look at this part here on the left, I just want to add this here. This is a, a new part that's not on your handout, but I want to maybe just write down some examples of convex functions for you so that when you look at them in the future, you can instantly tell whether the function is convex. Okay, so some examples of a convex function would be any constant. So for example, if my function was f of x equals minus 4, that's a convex function. Okay, any linear term, so any term that's just x. So if f of x was equal to 2x, that's a convex function because it's a weighted sum. Alpha 1 is equal to 2. x is linear. So that function 2x is equal to linear, is, is convex. So now you can see if I wrote, for example, 2x minus 4, that function is also convex. Because I'm taking a convex function plus a convex function, the result of that is also a convex function. So this is what we, why we need to understand convexity of simple functions. We're going to take a complicated function, break it down into its constituent parts, and if every constituent part is convex, the overall function is convex. And concave. Or if, it's, if the constituent parts are concave, plus concave, plus concave, the overall function is concave. But I mean like the constant is both concave and convex? Yeah, because these are linear. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now, x squared, concave, convex, convex. x cubed, is that concave or convex? Before you write it down, think about it. What does the plot of x cubed look like? Draw it on a piece of paper. Can you connect a line through that function so that every point lies above the function? Nope, okay. So not convex, x cubed is not convex. x to the 4. x to the 4 is like a parabola, but just even more steep. So that is convex. OK. e to the x, the exponent of something. What does the exponent function look like again? OK, here's a hint. It passes through 1. And then, yeah, concave or convex? Convex, OK? So exponent functions are convex. OK, let's put a few more up here. Uh, or oh, just one more. The log function. Concave, convex. What's the log of 1? Zero. 0. OK, so when x is equal to 1, it must pass through there. Then what does it do before and after that? Concave, convex. Concave. OK, so the log function is concave. OK, so that gives you some practice there. Now, why is this important? Well, we've already established that a function, f of x, if it's convex, if, and you can find an optimum for it, is a global optimum. But now let's take this up a notch. What if we add constraints? So then we call our optimization problem concave or convex. So we've looked <coughs> at functions being convex and concave, but let's look at the whole optimization problem. So if our objective function being minimized is convex, 
And every constraint, any nonlinear constraint, g, g, j of x is less than or zero, is convex. And if every constraint g, j of x greater than or equal to zero is concave, and every equality equation h i of x is zero is linear. If all of those are met simultaneously, then we say that that optimization problem is convex. And if you find an optimum for it, it's a global optimum. So let's run through that again. The objective function f of x must be convex. Every less than or equal to zero constraint must be convex. Every greater than or equal to zero constraint must be concave. And every equality must be set equal to 0. As long as what's on the left-hand side, is h of x, is linear, then that whole optimization problem is termed to be a convex optimization problem. And then if you find the optimum of that optimization problem, you don't even need to think or test anything. You know right away that that optimum is the global optimum. There's no other optimum that will give you a, a smaller minimum. So we can simply go and inspect every part of our objective function, every part of our constraints, and check it that way. This is such a, I can't even, I can't overstate how powerful this result is. There's so many branches of optimization study, but one of the most predominant is the branch of convex optimization. And many engineering problems of practical interest can be converted into um, convex optimization problems. Right? So we can reformulate our problems to be functions of linear functions, logs, exponentials, and so we can then guarantee that it's convex or, co or concave, as we'll see in a minute. Now, we've got all these great results, but there's one problem. Using that test for convexity is tedious. We can reformulate that convexity test into another tedious alternative, what's called the gradient test. I won't go into it, except that what that equation says is that the function lies above its tangent. Um, geometrically, what that means is the following. For the function to lie above its tangent, if we draw the function, here's the tangent. Okay, so the equation on the left-hand side is the function. The equation on the right-hand side is the tangent. And as long as that exists to be true for all values of x, the function is uh, convex. But that's not a practical test either. What is a little bit more practical are these last two. For a, uni for a univariate function, a function of a single variable, x, as long as the second derivative is positive for any value of x, then the function is convex. That's a great simple method to test. So for example, we now instantly can tell that if we have a term ax squared, it is convex for which values of a? What's the second derivative of that function? The first derivative is 2a, and the second derivative? 2a, 2a, 4a. What's the first derivative? 2x. Second derivative? 4a. Okay, so second derivative is 2a. That function is convex for every positive value of a. So a horns up parabola is convex. If a is negative, that implies horns are down, it's concave. So there's a quick test for univariate functions. Let's um, expand that a little bit now to multivariate functions. Multivariate functions, we can't be so concrete. And please um, update your notes here. There's a small error in your original notes. It says if the Hessian matrix is positive semi-definite for all values of x in the feasible region, then the function is convex. Okay, so just semi-definite. I think the original notes just said positive definite. So let me um, talk a little bit about that, and we'll use this example as a way to illustrate and distinguish between positive semi-definite and positive definite. 
And we'll do it visually using that example over here where we've got this function f of x. By inspection, can we tell if it's, if it's convex? 40, convex. Yes, no. Yes. X1 to the power 4, yes. convex. You can prove that the second derivative of that is always positive for any value of x. Minus 4x1 cubed, convex? No. We can't say. This term over here, x2 minus 5 squared, convex. OK, so we can't tell by inspection because of that problematic cubic term. So we have to resort to something a little bit more involved, which is then calculating the Hessian matrix, which is written down here for you. So no need to derive it, but you can check it. So the Hessian matrix is given over there. And let's take a look at it. I've plotted the function. And you notice then with the contours, there's actually two areas that seem to have the first derivative equal to 0. This point over here and this point over here. So two potential optimums with their first derivative equal to 0. The two locations are given by these values of x, 3 and 5, for the first point, the red triangle. And the blue triangle um, over there on the left is the 0, 5 point. Let's take a look at the 0, 5 point first. Sub 0, 5 into that Hessian matrix, h of 0, 5 simplifies down to 0, 0, 0, 6. OK. Is that matrix positive, definite, positive, semi-definite, negative, definite, negative, semi-definite? This is the test for convexity. Well, you don't know the answer yet. The answer is as follows. Any general matrix. of the form lambda 1, lambda 2, 0, 0 has eigenvalues of lambda 1 and lambda 2. Okay, That's a result from linear algebra that you may or may probably don't recall from second year. but So there it is. So what are the eigenvalues then of this Hessian matrix? 0 and 6. The second eigenvalue is positive. OK, so this is positive. This is 0. And as a result, we say this is positive semi-definite. OK, that's a positive semi-definite matrix. I'll just t give you a minute to take that down. And then I'll d explain the distinction between semi-definite and positive definite. OK, please note this result up here on the, about the two eigenvalues is only true if your off-diagonals are 0. If your off-diagonals are non-zero, you can't tell what the eigenvalues are unless you manually calculate them. But for that special case, we have that result. So I can erase this part here on the right. Let's take a look now at the point 3 and 5. So H3 and 5 has a Hessian matrix of what values? Thirty-six, zero, zero, six. So eigenvalues are thirty-six and six, and this is positive definite. Okay, so there you're seeing this, the distinction between positive semi-definite and positive definite. The distinction is, as long as all the eigenvalues are positive, it's positive definite. If one or more of the eigenvalues is 0, then we say it's semi-definite. If you had a mixture of eigenvalue signs, so some negative, some positive, then is the function concave or convex? Or ne neither? Neither. OK, so a mixture of signs, you can perhaps note this here, a mixture of signs implies 
neither concave nor convex. What are all the options of positive definiteness? Okay, so typically we'll only look at positive definiteness. And that if it's positive definite or positive semi-definite, then it's convex. The opposite case is positive semi, uh, sorry, negative semi-definite, negative definite is for, convex, for uh, concavity. So we only learn one, and then the other is by mirror image. But neither is neither a thing? Neither, the, the neither case comes when you get a mixture of signs. OK, so everyone clear on that uh, new terminology then? OK, so let's, uh, let's give this a bit of a test. OK, so answer question one. Is any linear programming problem convex? Any linear programming problem, is it a convex optimization problem? Which problems are convex optimization problems? Explain why. A linear programming problem, is it convex? Go back to the definition. A linear programming problem, what is its objective function? Concave or convex? convex. It's not a trick question. Convex. convex. The constraints for a linear programming problem? Convex. convex. Every equality constraint is linear. So a linear problem, any LP, when you find a solution, it's a global solution. Such a powerful result. Okay, why LPs are so important. Any optimum that you find from a linear programming problem, there's no point that can be better than that LP solution. A critical, critical result. Okay, so that's another reason why this understanding of convex optimization is so important. Now let's take a look at this next problem. Now there's a little bit of a trick here. I want you to pay attention to it. Is there a way that you can tell that that function, sorry, this optimization problem, I should say, is convex or concave or neither? Tyler? OK, the objective function has ln in it. Anything else that's bothering you about example two? One of the constraints is x1, x2. this is a nonlinear constraint. But does that mean that you can tell if it's convex or concave? No. OK, we can go check the, the Hessian matrix for this. It just basically the fact that we've got this nonlinearity term here, we can't go tell off the top of our. Yeah, but that it still doesn't make it. We can't just tell by inspecting that that it's that it's convex. Okay, so we're going to get to that. But I I don't even want to look at the constraints. Just look at the objective function in the optimization problem. It's stated as a maximization. So what do you have to check for over there? Devin? OK, so Devin's right. So this is expressed as a maximization. So we don't need to check for convexity. We should actually be checking for concavity. Every term in the optimization's objective function needs to be concave for a maximization problem. That's right at the top of the prior page. We had there that. If a function f of x is convex, then its negative is concave. But a local maximum exists, then it's a global maximum if the function is convex, uh, concave. So for maximization, we should, you can do one of two things. 
here, right? You can take this maximization problem and make it into a minimization problem and then just check for convexity. Or you can leave the problem as is and just check every term for concavity. So you got, you got the choice, you can do either one. Okay, good question. Do you check the constraints for concavity or convexity? Let's go back to the definition for a, con for a convex problem. Let's, let's presume we're going to go flip the signs in f of x and make it negative f of x. And we've now turned it into a minimization problem. So we, all we have to check then for that is that it's convex. But then what about the constraints? Constraints are checked as they stand. Okay, So if it's a less than or equal to 0 constraint, we still check for convexity. We don't go flip the constraints around. So let's, um, let's be clear on that. I'll, I'll re reiterate that. So this function is written as a maximization problem. We don't go check for convexity. We go and check for concavity. That's one option. Or the other option is flip the signs around. In other words, check minus 3x1 plus x2 minus 8 log of x1. And if that is convex, then your objective function is convex. So that's only a part of stating whether this optimization problem is convex. The next part is to go in and inspect the constraints. We need to go rephrase that constraint to be less than or equal to 0. That's easy. Take the 100 over to the left-hand side. We can go check if that's convex. And then the equality constraint, is that concave or convex? It's. It's linear, so it's, it's both concave and convex. So we've now reduced our problem down to checking basically that log function and to check, as Mark pointed out, the first constraint. Okay, so let's go do that. So the log function. We already know that it's concave or convex. Log? Concave. concave, OK. Can you prove it by taking the second derivative? Quickly calculate the second derivative of the log function. Okay, so the second derivative shows that it is negative for every value of x. So therefore, it is concave. So log of x is always concave. I mean, we can see that visually as well, right? We can draw the function as we had up there earlier. The log function looks like that. It is concave. But that's a, a quick, easy verification there for you. OK, so as written, max 3 of x minus x 1 plus 8 log of x1. So this part here is convex. Sorry, concave or convex. This part is concave. So therefore, the whole thing is considered to be concave. Okay, we can. Yeah. So we're not minimizing that. I'm going to leave it as maximizing. You can go do it but the opposite way around. Right? You can go prove that the derivative, the second derivative of the negative log of x is always positive. It's the same, the same result. Okay. See, you can go either one. If you leave it as a maximum, you want to check for concavity. If you leave it as a minimum, you want to check for convexity. Right? 
from that earlier result that we had. Okay, so we've proved that the objective function is concave. The last part we need to do is prove that the first constraint is convex. Can you do that quick? Prove that the first constraint is convex by using the Hessian function for it. Okay, so there's the, there's the function. We have to check it's a less than or equal to zero. So, so we have to check for convexity. First term is convex. This one we're unsure of. This is convex. That's convex. So the way that an optimizer would do this is we'll take this function g of x, calculate the first derivative, calculate the second derivative. So I'm not going to go through that process up here. I'll just write that the Hessian is equal to the following, 8 minus 1 minus 1, 2. Does your range of values not matter? Remember the rule is it's got to be for all values of x in the domain. Okay. So you don't look at the non-negativity constraints? Uh, we don't consider the non-negativity constraints, yeah. So here, all we're doing is I'm taking the first derivative, the second derivative. Notice that the second derivative is actually not a function of the x values. So this function, if we can tell that this Hessian is convex or concave, it will apply for the entire function everywhere. So. We obviously can't tell that the eigenvalues here are positive or negative by inspection, but you can believe me, I did this in MATLAB prior to the class, and it all the two, both eigenvalues are positive. So what is our conclusion from this then? It's a positive semi-definite or positive definite? Positive definite and therefore convex. Okay, so overall, is this a convex optimization problem or not? Just to wrap up. Sorry? Yes or no? We were checking the objective for concavity. Okay, so it looks like there's still confusion about the objective function. It's, it's, it's not so hard as I think it, it might seem to appear. The simple rule is the following. Check for minimize f of x. Is convex, okay? Check max f of x is concave. You do either or, okay? Which one did we do? Concave. The second one, did we find it was concave? Yes. yes, okay. So objective function is concave. The first constraint, convex or concave? Convex. convex, so so far it's a convex problem, right? It meets all the criteria for a convex problem. The third constraint, convex, convex or concave? Okay, so the equality in this case is 
or convex. Okay, so it's either concave or convex. It's linear, so it meets the criteria still for a convex optimization problem. So overall, every criteria is met there. Objective function is concave. The first constraint is convex. The third constraint is linear. Therefore, it's a, it's a convex optimization problem. Therefore, the x1 and x2 value that you'll find from this solution is a global optimum. What I'm going to leave for you to prove at home to yourself is that last example. Prove to yourself that it is neither concave nor convex. Okay. What is the problematic equation, in fact? Just by inspection, what do you think is going to be your issue? Okay, so that's not linear. Anything else that's going to instantly? That's going to be your problem. The objective function is easy in this one. Okay, so it's nonlinear. So the second, this last constraint is nonlinear. Okay, so a lot of good discussion. I, I like the sort of uh, questions and the concerns that you have. Next class, we didn't get to the new handout, so please bring the, the handouts with you to the next class.